So today is the beginning of our four-week series called Win-Win Outreach. And what we're going to be doing in this series is basically what they just sang about, that we're going to follow God into the world. And what does that look like? So during this series, what we're going to be doing is today we're going to be focusing on why and what is so important to the heart of God about this area. Why is this such a dear and close topic for him? Next week, hope you make a commitment to being here next week. Next week, I'm going to peel back some layers on the way that we have been thinking about poverty and help you to start seeing that in a brand new way and new understanding of what that looks like. And then we're also going to be looking towards the end of this series about looking at some local and international ministries that are doing this outreach win-win style in a really, really good way and being successful at that. Let me start off with this. How many of you remember... Uh, how many of you as kids were outside like all the time? All the time, right? I'm pretty sure my parents put us outside and then clicked the lock on the door. Uh, most, anybody else do that? That wasn't normal parenting? Is that what we're doing? Okay. Outside all the time, riding bikes, playing wiffle ball, hiking in the woods, playing basketball. It was hard for our parents to get us back inside. Okay? I see a lot of nodding heads for that. Today's a little different, isn't it, with kids? Now, now we have kids. <laughs> Joe, there was, there was some anger in that statement right there, buddy. There was some, I, I felt the frustration, buddy. I, I felt you there. So. And, and now we're, they kind of have this next generation of kids that's growing up, and what? They're, they're on their phones and on their tablets, and they're playing video games, and you make them go outside. If you had to push your kids outside, and they go outside, and they're like, what? 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 What is the bright thing in the sky? What is it? It's all this green stuff, you know? Like, they have no idea what's going on. And what do you basically you just got to tell them, like, guys, you need to get out of the house more, right? Jim Wallace is a, a Christian leader who focuses on the area of living lives of compassion. And he wrote a book called Faith Works, and he gives us a starting point for building these compassionate hearts that we've been singing about this morning. And the catchphrase that he uses is simply that, you've got to get out of the house more. What he simply means by that is that each of us tends to live in our own little slice of the world where we feel comfortable. So I live my life, I go to school, I shop, I work, I go to church, I play with people who are like me, and our society, we just it just divides folks up that way. It puts all kinds of real subtle barriers in between different kinds of people. And as long as I don't get out of the house or get out of my comfort zone, people who live in other conditions, people who are different from me, that have a different language, who have a different accent, who have a different skin color, who have a different economic condition, they're not really on my radar screen. They're just not in my mind and they're not in my heart. And most people who are deeply committed to the ministry of compassion, who are building bigger hearts and trying to extend themselves as Jesus did, most folks in that condition will trace their own transformation to some point when they went to a third world country or had a cross-cultural experience or went to a neighborhood in the city and had some real experience with some real people who had real names and real faces. And usually what transforms people when it comes to this business of growing compassionate hearts, it's not a great talk, it's not a good book, it's not a powerful documentary or a really moving film. Instead, it's a real-life experience that grips your heart and seizes your vision, and it immerses you in the life of a real person. You've got to get out of the house more and see what God is doing in the world around us and figure out where it is that you're supposed to plug in to his greater work. And if you do that, if you get outside of your normal world, if you serve and pray and interact at a real life level with a real person with a real name, your heart will be touched and your life will be forever changed. James 2 says this, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if somebody claims to have faith but has no deeds, can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food, and if one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. 
We can't just talk about this. This can't be something that we just sit around and say, oh, yes, yes, kumbaya, this is a great thing to do. I agree wholeheartedly with this. It, it's not enough to talk about this. That talk has to translate into action. And it shifts in our focus from being about us to being Christ to others. And we are never more like Christ than when we are serving. James 1, 26 and 27 says, Anyone who sets himself up as religious by talking a good game is self-deceived. This kind of religion is hot air and only hot air. Real religion, the kind that passes muster before God the Father is this. Reach out to the homeless and loveless in their plight and guard against corruption from the godless world. It's a transition. It's a mindset shift from deciding we're not going to go after the American dream anymore. Instead, we're going to chase after God's dream for our life. And this reality of missing out on what matters to God, this has been going on for a long time. And the Old Testament part of the Bible, which is the part of the scriptures that tell us about life before Jesus came to earth, 700 years before Jesus, people were missing out on what was important to the heart of God. They were doing their own thing. They were playing church. So God needed to clarify his expectations. He needed to remind them again of the big picture. And in Micah 6, 8, it says, He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? How many of you have asked that question? What is God? What do you want from me, God? What do you want from me? Here it is, cut and dry. What does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. We flash forward 700 years to when Jesus was here. Jesus had come to seek and save those who were far from God. And the group of people that he was the toughest on were actually those who claimed to already know what following after God was all about. In Matthew 23, Jesus is really giving it to the religious people who think they have it all figured out. And he knows their hearts. And he points out that the majority of what they're doing, their outward signs of religion, are simply being done for show. Their hearts aren't in the right place. They get so caught up in what they consider to be important, the do's and don'ts, about following after God, that they completely miss out on the big picture that God's trying to get across to them. So after giving example after example of how they're just playing church, he says this in Matthew 23. You have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. And we see throughout Scripture, throughout the 2,000 plus verses in Scripture that are about this topic, that justice and mercy are always grouped together. Every time we get into a teaching that defines what we're supposed to be about in this lifetime. These are the things that are near and dear to God's heart. So if we really mean it when we say we want to follow God, if we really mean it when we invite Jesus into our hearts and commit our lives to his purposes, then we have to be about the same things. All you have to do is read through the, first, the four Gospels. That's the first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You see that Jesus cared about the whole person, not just the spiritual life. Time after time, we see him healing people from different diseases and suffering. Time after time, we see him correct a wrong that's being done to someone or challenge the thinking of people who think that they are better than others. Time after time, we see him asking questions that force people to really reevaluate how committed they are to following him and these teachings about the kingdom of heaven that he shared. Jesus was always concerned with the whole person, their health, their family, their work, their values, their relationships, their behavior towards others, and the condition of their soul. Jesus embraced this new vision for our world, a vision that involved our planet being transformed by transformed people, a vision of a group of people that would be the salt and light in a world that desperately needs them, a vision of a group of people who would give their lives to his greater purpose. And he wants us to be consumed with those things that matter the most to him. He wants us to be engaged with the world and making a difference. He wants us to be aware of what the issues are that are facing his children all over this planet. And he wants us to be broken when we see the tens of thousands of people who are falling through the cracks while everybody else just turns their back on them. 
People matter to God. And God has a special place in his heart for the poor and the needy. So if we're going to dare claim to be his followers, we have to develop the same heart that God has for the poor and the needy. We need to make it more of a priority in our lives. We need to do more individually. We need to do more as a church family in this area. We have to make this and take deeper ownership of what needs to be done. You know, in biblical times, just as we see today, there are those groups of people that get marginalized and they're seen as outcast or less deserving than others. But scripture makes it clear that all of those people have tremendous value to God. Each one of them has a special place in his heart. And if we are to be his agents of love in the world around us, then we are to be people who see every individual with that same innate dignity and value. If we are to carry out his purposes, if we are to live lives of compassion and justice, then we are to be people who are champions of that dignity. I want you to think for a moment, what would happen if we were each to join God in his work to lift up the dignity, to lift up the name of each person in this world? What would happen if we chose to do that? What does it look like for us together as a church to do that? What does that look like for us individually to do that? And what I want to do today is I want to walk through four commitments that can help all of us to live a life of more compassion and justice. Four commitments that can help us to join God in his work to lift up the dignity and the name of every person in this world. The first commitment is very simple. The first commitment is, I will see. Say that with me. I will see. I will see the needs in this world. I will see the individuals. It's a commitment to be aware. It's a commitment to pay attention, to refuse to be sucked into the self-centered mentality where we think that the rest of the world revolves around us. It's a commitment to say, I'm going to see the neighbor who's really struggling. It's a commitment to say, I'm going to see the child who's showing signs of abuse. It's a commitment to say, I'm going to see the people who are going to the window or the Salvation Army because they need food. It's a commitment to say, I'm going to see the reality of what is really going on in other parts of the world. Part of our purpose of this series is so that all of us together can grow and learn and we can see together how we can increase our own awareness. But what are you going to do to grow in your ability to see outside of our time together on Sunday mornings? There's a lot of things that you can do. Locally, you can go visit a service organization, find out what they do, find out about the opportunities to get involved. Tracy and I this past week went over to Elkhart and it was spa. How many of you have heard of the spa women's ministries? Okay. They're going to be with us in a couple weeks. I didn't even know about them until just a couple months ago. And they're right here basically in our own backyard. But for Tracy and I to go and to, to sit down and talk with these ladies that, that have this huge passion for this ministry, that was us being intentional about getting outside of our house more and seeing what God is doing in the world around us. But we have to do that with intentionality. And because we chose to do that, because we got out of the house, because we got together with people who God has given a vision for an important ministry in this area, now we see what's going on. And because of that, we're going to have an opportunity to hear from them in a couple weeks and an opportunity for some of you, if God pulls on your heartstrings for that ministry, to get involved with that. But it's being intentional with getting outside of our house and seeing what God is doing in the world around us with intentionality. Internationally, there's websites to find out how people are being helped around the world. <clears throat> you guys know that we're ministry partners with Kids Alive, with Destiny Rescue, with Awaken Alive. There are ministry partners. Do you check out their websites regularly? I wonder how many of you are on their e-newsletters or maybe their mailed newsletters to keep up with what God is doing. We have the dates for our upcoming mission trip, February 4th through the 11th. This will be the eighth team that CCW has sent down to the Dominican Republic. 
And that has been an amazing ministry for us. And the connections that we have there are so incredible. And the long-term effect of our partnership with them is huge. And I'm going to be sharing about that in a few weeks. But we need to stop living in ignorance of the bigger picture. There is no excuse for us to not be able to get outside of our houses. With the technology we have today, with the internet stuff that we can so easily access to get information, there is no excuse for those of us who are Christ followers to be in ignorance of what God is doing in the world around us. But this ignorance isn't just restricted to the United States. The majority of the world's population lives in ignorance of what is going on in the world right around them. I was reading uh, this blog from a missionary, and it was saying that on her plane ride to Zimbabwe, she was going there to help set up this food food distribution centers for some of the poor communities there. And she met this wealthy lady from Zimbabwe returning home, and this is what she wrote of their encounter. I asked her a little bit about herself, and she just started talking. She told me about how rough it was for her in Zimbabwe. She told me about the gated home that she had. She told me about how much she wanted to do to update and remodel her home and how so many home projects were on her list that she could hardly keep up with them. And then she went on to tell me about the housekeepers that she has and how high maintenance they are and how hard it is to make sure that they're doing the right things and keeping up the standard that she wants in the home where she lives. And then she told me how many times she has to travel to the U.S. to do her retail shopping therapy to be able to cope with how rough life is. And as I'm reading this, and maybe it hits you the same way, I'm thinking, where's the disconnect here? This woman lives in Zimbabwe, where there are so many children who don't have enough food to eat, and there are people who live in that country, very wealthy people, who don't see it? How is that possible? And then I realized, I could be just like her. As I'm going about my day, I can be just like her like her. I get caught up in my own life. I get so busy that I'm not able to see how many children every morning go to school hungry right here in Goshen area. Or I get so busy that I don't see the family that's trying desperately just to make ends meet. Or I get so busy that I don't see the neighbors that suddenly left their house because it went into foreclosure. It is so easy for us to get caught up and consumed with life and not be able to see. For us together to resolve that, we are going to join God in his work to lift up the dignity and name of each person in this world. It has to first of all start with a commitment to say, I will see. The next commitment is to say, I will feel. Say that one with me. I will feel. I will feel. Several times in the New Testament, it states that Jesus was moved with compassion. Matthew 14 says this, when Jesus landed... He was out in the boat. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he what? Had compassion on them. Now, that doesn't really surprise us, Jesus having compassion. But sometimes when we read about this, we need to know what happened just before this. Let's put this into context, because right before that, we read about Herod, who's the local ruler, and his wife and daughter from a previous marriage. And there's this big party going on and drinking and dancing. And in the midst of his stupidity and drinking and everything, Herod makes this promise to give the daughter whatever she wants. And his wife convinces the daughter to go and ask him for the head of John the Baptist for him to be beheaded because he's just this, in their minds, this this annoying guy. And there's some more storyline behind that. But long story short, she says, I want this guy beheaded. And this is a friend of Jesus. And Jesus is hearing the news, and obviously he's got to be devastated by this. So he goes in a boat to go to this solitary place. He wants to be alone, understandable, isn't it? He needs to go somewhere where he can be alone. But the crowds, because he's so famous and popular, the crowds hear about it, and they go along the shoreline to meet him where he's planning on coming ashore. Now, we would not have blamed Jesus if with what just happened to John and in his desire to be alone, if he had decided to turn his boat around and go elsewhere. We wouldn't blame him, would we? It's what we do all the time when we get overwhelmed by stuff going on in our lives. 
We have this tendency to, to shut down making connections with others and we get absorbed in our own world. But that's not what Jesus did. Scripture tells us that he saw the crowd and he what? He had compassion on them. He saw them and he had compassion on them. He chose, he chose to feel. And the Greek word for this phrase, had compassion on, it actually means this deep guttural reaction. It's this deep feeling. It means that Jesus had a pit in his stomach when he saw the needs of the world. It means that if we're going to join God in his work, not only do we see, but we have to allow ourselves to feel deeply. I've been on seven trips to the DR, and I can so vividly remember our first trip there, seeing the children for the first time, seeing the living conditions that they had, seeing the, ama- the just overwhelming needs that were there. And there was something at the core and depth of my soul that felt something I had never felt before. I allowed myself to feel like Jesus feels all the time. I allowed all of that hurt to soak in at the deepest level. I chose to allow myself to feel what God feels. And again, I'm going to be sharing some stories about that because that is an unbelievable place and we've fallen so in love with that place. But it's why I've taken, some of you know Bill Hybels from Colorado. It's why I've taken his challenge seriously. That his commitment is to go to third world country every year. Because he needs to be broken again and again and again. To what God sees all the time. And you know what? It's okay to be broken again and again and again if it makes you more like Jesus. And I want to ask you, when is the last time that you literally had a pit in your stomach because of the needs in our world or because of the brokenness that you see in our world? Is there something out there as far as the needs in our world that actually just at the depth of who you are just grinds? When is the last time you felt that deeply about something? There have been many seasons in my life when I've not been able to feel the way that I want to. And if I'm honest with you, I can look back through those seasons when it's been really hard for me to connect with the brokenness in our world. And it's in those seasons when I was the farthest from God. It's been those seasons that I would describe as distant or dry in my relationship with him. And it takes me being honest with God and saying, God, I want to connect with you more. And I want to connect with the way that you see this world. I want to connect with the way that you see the brokenness around this world. And I want to encourage you, are you able to feel deeply when you see what's going on in our community or when you see what's going on in the world? And if not, I would encourage you to ask God to work in your heart so that you could see and feel about the world the way that he does. I will see, I will feel. Third one is, I will act. Say that with me. I will act. I will resolve that when I see a need, that when I feel deeply, I will respond to it. Jesus knew that if there was a need, that he would meet it. It was a very simple thing for him to do. In fact, that same passage in Matthew 14, 14 ends with Jesus meeting a need. So let's look back at that verse in its entirety. It says, Jesus landed and he saw a large crowd. He had compassion on them and he healed their sick. Right away, Jesus took action. And we see it again in the feeding of the 5,000. The disciples wanted to send the people home. We don't have any food. Let's send them home. Let's get them out of here. Let's let them fend for themselves. But Jesus says, no, no, no. We're going to feed them right now. Right now, we will feed them. We will take action now. And I love when I hear stories from you about how you see a need and you simply did what was necessary to meet that need. You saw it, you figured out a solution for it, and you made it happen. And I see this happening more and more with our life groups, which I absolutely love. Because we need to realize that sitting around a table together and talking, that's great, but it's not enough. 
It needs to be lived out in tangible ways. Otherwise, we are just deceiving ourselves and we're just playing church. And as we take action, it's a chance for us to join God in his work, to lift up the name and dignity of people. But that action eventually leads to wanting to take deeper action, and that takes us to our fourth commitment. And this is our commitment to say, I will advocate. Say that with me. I will advocate. I will give a voice to those in need. I will be an advocate for people. I will be an advocate for peace. I will be an advocate for a better world. I will stand up and I will speak for what I believe. In almost every culture in this world, there's a group of people who are looked down upon, who are considered less than. And that's true whether we're talking here in the U.S. or any other nation in the world. So think about that for a moment. In the world that you live in, in the context that you live in, who are the people who are the most looked down upon? Who are the people who are the most misunderstood? Do you even see them? Do you even feel what they feel? And are you driven to action? And are you driven to advocate and give them a voice? Because I guarantee that if you do that, you will then want to say, I will advocate. Because you're going to want to tell their stories. You're going to want to help other people understand what life is like for them. We can be people who speak up for those whose names are not heard and whose stories are not known. We can join God in this work. There are all kinds of ways to advocate for others. Some of you are going to advocate by how you talk to businessmen and businesswomen and get them involved. Some of you are going to advocate by how you tell other stories. Some of you will advocate by how you write your blogs. You're going to advocate in how you instill values in your children. And when we use social media responsibly, it can be a great resource for advocating for those things that matter most to the heart of God. We can share the stories of those who can't share their own stories. Now, how many of you are on Facebook? How many of you are connected with Destiny Rescue on Facebook? For those that are newer, we connect with Destiny Rescue out out of Syracuse. They rescue children out of the sex trafficking trade primarily in Asia right now, but they've started down in the Dominican as well. Every week, they come out with a little clip that they have, uh, an article about how many children were saved that week. And just by the simple act of those of us who decide to share that link so that thousands and thousands of other people can see that and look at that and go, what is this all about? What are we doing? We're being advocates. We're saying this matters. It matters to God, it matters to me, and it needs to matter to you as well. And by the simple act of sharing something on social media, we become advocates for a greater cause. And this, the last Wednesday of this month at WOW, Waterford on Wednesdays, I want to invite you to be here at 6.30 to 8. And I want you to invite as many people as you possibly can. Because Tony Kerwin is going to be here. He is the founder of Destiny Rescue. He is in Asia primarily. And he's going to be back in the States for a little bit. And they go around and have these things called Tony Talks. And he goes to different cities and shares. And they ask different churches to be the host site. And we've been asked to be the host site for the Tony Talk on September 28th. So I was hoping they were going to have the cards to me this week to be able to pass out. We'll have those for next Sunday. But September 28th, Tony's going to be here. He goes in and does, he goes in and visits these brothels. He goes in and does these rescues. He is right there face to face with what is going on in that ministry. And he's going to come and he's going to share some stories with us. But again, how can you be an advocate? You get the word out. When you start seeing Luke post on our Community Church of Waterford Facebook page, you hit the share button. You get it out to everybody that you know. When we have the postcards next week, you take some of those and you start handing those out at work. You start becoming an advocate for something that matters to the heart of God. It doesn't have to be a complicated thing. But we have to be an advocate for those things that matter to God. We have to say, this is important. And we need to help the rest of the world wake up and see what is going on in the world around us. I mean, think about that. A year and a half ago, how many of you really knew nothing about human trafficking? And before Destiny Rescue came along, 
I mean, we'd heard about it, right? But how many of you, you're like, you're like pfft, mind blown in the last year and a half since we've partnered with them? Why? Because we are choosing to see. We are choosing to feel. We are choosing to act. And we are choosing to advocate for those precious children. And that is a game changer when we step into that. 1 John 2 says, we have an advocate with the Father. And that advocate is who? Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He's the one who pays the cost for our sins, and then he turns around and he defends us as being innocent. Jesus is our advocate. And maybe there's somebody in this room who will say that because Jesus is an advocate on my behalf, I'm going to be an advocate on the behalf of others. We need to speak up and we need to advocate for those whose voices are not heard. I want to finish by telling you a story I read about a man from Africa. And this man was explaining that he was born to this very poor family in Uganda. He was born in a rural tribe where life exists on a day-to-day -day basis. And where there is never a promise of tomorrow. And he described that at the time of his birth, almost 50% of children did not live until the age of two. 50% of children died before their second birthday. Most of the moms couldn't face the potential of becoming attached to their children and then losing them. And so one of the coping mechanisms for the moms in this village and in many villages throughout Africa was to wait on giving their child a name until they knew the child was going to live. You see, a name creates connection. It creates relationship with the family. It creates a legacy. And this man wrote these words. This is the reality that my mother faced as she brought me into this world. Because she feared that she would lose me, I did not have a name for the first two years of my life. But day by day, God's provision pr proved sufficient, and I reached the age of two. And my mother realized that I could make it to the age of three, and therefore she gave me the name Habya Rimana, which means a product or a gift from God. For my mother, this name was a description of what the Lord had done for her in keeping me alive. For me, this name has become a daily reminder of God's grace and protection over my life. You know, there are children in this world who won't even have a chance to be named unless we are willing to stand up and advocate for them. Unless we are willing to advocate for mothers who so desperately want to be able to see their own children grow. Abiyad Ramana not only lived past the age of two, but he went on to get his education. And today, he works for Compassion International. And he himself is a voice for children and mothers in this world. He has declared, somebody advocated for me, and I will give my life to advocate for others. So I challenge you to think about what would happen if you were to join God in his work to lift up the name and the dignity of each person in this world? What would that look like for you? What could God be calling you to do if you were to say, I will see, I will feel, I will act, and I will advocate? And I want to encourage every single one of you to think about the role that you can play in joining God in doing this. And I want to challenge you that as we go through this series to take time on your own with God and ask him these questions and really listen for an answer. Ask him, God, how do you want to use me? How can you use me to be a part of joining you in your work in this world? How do I get out of the house more, God? And watch God start to work in your heart and mind in a brand new way. All because you are willing to see, to feel, to act, and to advocate for those things that matter the most to him. Let's pray. God, we know that what we have started today is something that is so near and dear to your heart. And that's where we needed to start today, Lord, was being reminded that because these things are so vitally important and central to who you are and why you came, 
they need to be just as important and central to us. So God, we just pray that as we go through this series, would you help us to take that time with you to ask those questions? How do we get outside of our house more? How do we see what you are doing in the world around us? How do we figure out, Lord, what it is that we're supposed to be a part of? What is our piece in the bigger picture, in the bigger puzzle? Where do you want us to see and feel and act and advocate? And we trust that if we ask those questions with sincere hearts, that you will give us clear answers, Lord. And we will be able to step up our game and start following after you at a whole new level. And you will start to do things in us and through us that will change the world around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this week we talked about what's near and dear to the heart of God. And next week what I want to do, again, we're going to take a look at, okay, we want to be people of compassion. We want to reach out to people. But how do we know that what we're doing when we reach out is actually effective? How do we know the difference between when we're reaching out and making a lasting impact and when we're reaching out and maybe doing more harm than good? That's what we're going to talk about next week. So you guys have an awesome week. Get out of the house more. Get your shades on. Get out there, see what God's doing, and figure out where you're going to join in. If you'd like to get some prayer this morning, we've got some of our prayer warriors up here. They'd be more than happy to meet with you. Have a great week.